Cameron today. This, this talk is a uh, talk which is also a previous version we did uh, in conjunction with Nick Nethercote, uh, who's one of the, another author of Valgrind. Um, so the project's been around about, about five years and um, not in public visibility for that five years. And the original aim was to build a replacement for a very excellent debugging tool called Purify, which is a commercial tool that um, runs on Solaris, it's, it's inexpensive, uh, and it had some design problems. So I wanted to build essentially my own version of Purify that ran on Linux, because Purify, I don't know if you ever used it, is a great tool. Um, so that was the original intention. Uh, along the way, the uh, design aim changed rather. So it's changed away from just being a memory debugging tool. So what we think of uh, as Valgrind now is it's actually a framework for building uh, simulation-based tools for, for user space processes in Linux. Uh, and most of, most of what is Valgrind is actually this framework. The tools that you actually use, the, the memory debugging tools and the profiling tools, is um, a relatively thin layer uh, built on top of Valgrind. So um, there have been quite a few tools that have come and gone, some experimental, some which are good enough for actual real-world use. Um, we, have, uh, we have Memcheck, which is uh, the, the memory debugging tool. And uh, I think that's what a lot of people actually think Valgrind is. We just think of Valgrind as the whole framework, not just the tool. Uh, we, we had a, a, a thread checking tool called Helgrind, although that doesn't work anymore, uh, which is unfortunate. We also have um, a whole bunch of profiling tools. Um, you may have used um, Calltree and the Kcashgrind GUI. It's a KDE application. Uh, we have Massif, which uh, is a space profiler, which doesn't get much use, but uh, it, it ought to get more use. It tells you where you're allocating stuff. Uh, and we have cache grain, which is a kind of an, a rather nice low-level profiler, which tells you about cache misses primarily. Uh, there have been various other experimental tools, some of them quite sophisticated, some runtime type checking tools. Um, but usually, experimental tools don't get to a stage where you can really use them for real. Uh, and it runs on essentially any modern Linux distribution on any architecture, almost, that you might reasonably want to run it on. So there's no excuse to, use, to not use it now. Uh, it's also not a toy tool. It, it, you get complete coverage of your entire user space application right down to the kernel level through libc, through the dynamic linker. Um, you see everything. Uh, you, you don't need the source code. or you, you can deal with libraries for which you don't have the source code, uh, which is actually kind of important for pr debugging proprietary applications or with proprietary libraries. And it, it works, you know, on large systems, so it runs OpenOffice, no problem. OpenOffice being a large system. We have people that tell us you go up to about 25 million lines of code, runs okay. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Memcheck, which is our, our most popular tool. We know that about 90% of the users um, use, of our users use Memcheck more than any other tool. Uh, but first a bit about the, the infrastructure. So one of the, one of the things you notice if you want to start building simulation-based tools is that often what you want to, the instrumentation that you want to add to your program to, to collect information like profiling data or error checking data is relatively simple. You know, you might want to count the number of instructions that have been done or the number of cache misses or something. And that's not very difficult. The real problem is to, to build an environment in which you can run your real, real application with its system calls and signals and threads and God knows what else and, and actually collect this stuff up. So, so getting it into a program is difficult. What, what Valgrind really provides, which is so useful, is to provide a common infrastructure which does all the really nasty crap bits of this problem. So it, it hides all the details of your um, processor by unpicking your instruction stream into uh, an architecture neutral representation, which the tools can then deal with. Uh, it does this 
um, while the program is running. It's a dynamic translation-based scheme, so you don't need to relink or recompile or anything. It's very easy to use. You can just, you know, you can type Valgrind ls and it'll do whatever with ls. And as I said before, it um, covers <coughs> everything, even stuff for which you don't have the source code for. Um, so, yeah, the common infrastructure provides threads, system calls, signal support, provides reading of debugging information, uh, provides all sorts of facilities which you can use to um, build the tools you want. Uh, it allows you to look um, at all the addresses that the program deals with, and it allows you to look at all the data that the program computes. If you add two things in your code, then you can see, the, you can see you know, what you got if you want to see that. In, in the tool. Um, so, so the tools, you get this nice architecture independent code representation which the tools can add instrumentation code to so that one, you know, you write a tool once and then it works on x86 or PowerPC or whatever with uh, almost no extra effort. Um, the tool can see the events that are significant to it like thread state changes for threading tools or malicon free changes for memory tracking tools things like that. And uh, there's no obligation to do any of these things. So you can write a really simple tool which will count the number of, say, basic logs executed in about 100 lines of code and just link it in and you have the, then you have a tool which you know, will run anything and do that. So let me talk about Memcheck because this is perhaps the most widely used tool. And there's not enough time to talk about the rest of them anyway. Uh, so I really think of Memcheck as doing three separate things, which I'll go through later. Memcheck will tell, look in detail at addresses in the program. This is summary. Um, so it'll, it'll tell you where you're reading or writing in, in bad places. And this includes um, telling you about reading and writing freed memory. It tracks, mem tracks the addressability of memory on a byte-by-byte -byte basis. Um, it tells you about when you're doing bad thing with ma bad stuff with malloc and free, you know, freeing stuff in the wrong order or accessing memory after you freed it. So it's kind of like a policeman for the malloc free interface. And I think the most interesting thing about Memcheck, or in my view anyway, is the fact that it um, will find uninitialized value errors, places where you're using data which, you know, in a reasonable interpretation of C is uninitialized. And in, compared to other tools like Purify and Third Degree, which is a, an alpha tool, and various others, we think it does actually a better, better job than any commercial tool you can get. We actually know of no other tool, honestly, which will track, find single uninitialized bits in, in code. And we, we often have seen to find a single uninitialized bit in applications. So, perhaps the first and simplest thing it finds is addressing errors. And this is pretty simple stuff. So if you allocate, say, a 4-byte block, then what, what you'll get is your 4 bytes, and then you get some red zones on either side of it. And if you, um, you read or write in the red zone, then uh, the tool complains like that, and it, it tries to explain you, know, you, you did an invalid write, and it tries to explain what the invalid address is in terms of stuff that you can understand. Um, so then when you free the thing up, then the whole block is point, painted red, and then if you if you write in, or read or write in that, that area, then it complains again, except this time it's telling you that you're dealing in a freed area. So this is probably pretty stuff if you've used the tool. There are a couple of subtle points. One point is that these uh, red zones are only finite size. They're actually 16 bytes long um, in a standard build of Valgrind. So if you um, write, if you do a really screwed up write and you know, hit here or here, then you may not actually uh, be told about this because it can't tell you. Obviously, we'd prefer the red zones to conceptually be infinitely long for each block, but uh, that's not feasible. Another observation is that um, a conventional implementation of malloc or free will want to try and bring back um, into circulation memory that you've freed as fast as possible 
to you know, minimize the total amount of working set that you have. Whereas we want to do the exact opposite. When you um, free something, we want to keep it out of circulation as long as possible. So when you free memory, um, when you're running a program on Valgrin, that free thing is put at the end of a long block of free, long queue of free blocks, and then you have to wait for it to come back into use. If, and during that time that it's out of use, any invalid access, any access to it, you will know about. But at some point, this comes back into use, and then if you're using it mistakenly with old pointers in some sense, then you won't know. So it's not quite those subtleties, and if you understand these subtleties, that helps. We, we get people asking, I did this really stupid write, you know, 55 bytes before this block, and it didn't tell me, or 100 bytes before this block, so why not? Well, that's the sort of reason. <clears throat> the second thing that uh, memcheck will do is um, leak detection. <clears throat> so uh, memcheck is intercepting all your malloc and free calls and um, uh, doing its own implementation of malloc and free and, and new and delete, whatever. And uh, it keeps track of all these blocks and where you allocated them and where you freed them. And when, when the program comes to an end or, or just when you ask, um, it will scan the entire address space and look for pointers to blocks which haven't been freed. It's a sort of pretty standard leak check. And it um, will classify the blocks that it can still find into um, three classifications. So if you, if, if you can find the, this cloudy bit is intended to be the heap. Uh, if, you, if it can find a pointer to a block, to the start of a block, then it believes that block is reachable. You know, you still have a pointer to it. You could at least have freed it up. Um, if, it can't find a, if it can't find a pointer to the block at all, then it's, there's no way you could have freed it, so it's definitely leaked. Um, if it can find a pointer that points in the middle of the block, well, you know, it's not exactly clear if you really had a pointer to the start of the block or whether it's just a coincidence. So uh, that's classified as possibly leaked. So it will tell you at the end, you know, you have this many bytes definitely leaked, possibly leaked, and still reachable. And you, you really want to um, get that down to zero if you can. Otherwise, your program's probably leaking. It's another useful classification, and uh, it often seems to confuse people that use Valgrind, we find from the mailing lists. Um, that it will distinguish between um, directly and indirect leaks. And this, this is very useful. So we have this block here which is, has no pointer added at all in the heap, and so that is directly leaked. So this block here, by the rules up, up here, is not, uh, is not actually leaked because there's still a pointer to it. But there's only a pointer to it because it's, there's a pointer from some other block in the heap which has already been lost. So this is classified as indirectly leaked. And the, the reason this is useful is um, for detecting cyclic garbage, um, you know, garbage cycles like this. By the rules up there, all of these blocks are not leaked, but in fact, there's no point to any of, you can't start getting into the cycle, so they're, they're leaked, really. Uh, that was the later refinement. Um, I should also point out, people seem to have this impression, if you use Valgren's or Memcheck's leak checker, that you know, there's something exact about, uh, about it. And in fact, the whole thing is a giant kludge. <laughs> the, first, the first version was hacked up in four hours. It kind of got refined after that. But, <laughs> but, but the honest truth is that you you know, leak checking in C, C++ really is a kludge because there's no reliable way to tell what is a pointer and what is an integer which just happens to look like a pointer but isn't really a pointer. Uh, if you're really unlucky, the, the compiler can sometimes optimize in ways which cause pointers to sort of disappear. So um, that's kind of weird. Uh, and, and it's not, not exactly um, always clear where, where we should look for pointers when the program is finished and where we shouldn't. It, it sort of gets better, but it's not great. It's inherently a problem with the language. Also, you get weird shit like glibc hangs on to pointers sometimes. The STL 
causes all manner of problems because it allocates large blocks and then chops the blocks up and ha hands them out itself. It has its own allocators, I think. So, uninitialized value checking. So what does, what does that really mean? Well, it, it kind of really means when, when you finding out when your program is using data which has no sort of meaning in, by the de definition of C. So data that comes from malloc blocks is considered uninitialized. If you use that before you write in the block, then you kind of have a problem. Similarly, local variables on the stack. So, well, this is a simple example. This is arrays full of junk. So if you do a test like this, then the, you know, the test is meaningless. And it, and it says exactly this um, when you do that, which is kind of useful to know. There's a kind of question about how, how this is done. So rough, roughly how all this works is, here's, here's your original computation above the black line. You pull a couple of values out of memory, add them, and put them back there or somewhere. Um, in the background, where you can't see it, um, Memcheck is maintaining a couple of couple of large bitmaps, one of which tells, <coughs> tells you which addresses in memory it's okay to look at and it, which are not. So the, uh, these bits are used for the leak checking and for the addressability checking. It's also maintaining, for each original bit of data there, you have a corresponding bit of data here. So it pulls it uses these V bits to um, check the defined, to track the definedness of the data here. So you, you, you pull your corresponding V bits out of memory and, and do some weird computation in the background which gives you an approximation to the definedness of the result. So what one, re one upshot of this is that you can, if you add two garbage values together, then it'll decide that this is garbage, but it doesn't actually complain at that point. This is a design decision. Let's see, yeah. So, one of the most, perhaps one of the most problematic things is to decide when should we actually complain about your using uninitialized values. This is not, not an easy problem. So the, the th the obvious thing to do would be just to complain whenever you're pulling uninitialized data out of memory, like you know, pulling it out of your stack or malloc block. Um, this this does, actually doesn't work at all. Um, I think it's what Purify does, but with some tricks. Um, the, the, the real problem, if you complain about reading uninitialized data out of memory, is um, if you for example, if you have a struct like this, then the compiler is going to put a, a three or seven byte hole here, just so that the int is then, then aligned properly. And so um, if you then have a structure assignment like that, then well, it's going to complain about the three garbage bytes that you copied from the middle of one struct into the middle of another struct. And uh, we have done some experiments to check this is true. and you get absolutely flooded with errors, which are not really errors if you, if you complain at that point. Uh, and uh, another thing is um, the, the decision which is sort of shown here that we don't, even if you're doing arithmetic or you know, whatever kind of arithmetic, floating point, vector, scalar, integer arithmetic, you don't complain um, if, if you compute garbage values. You just track garbage through the system, and you only complain, well, at some later point. So yeah, the summary is if you, if you report errors early, then, or if you try and report uninitialized values too early, then you get a lot of false positives. Um, the problem is if you do the opposite and allow garbage to be copied around the system a long time before you complain, then it's actually difficult for programmers to figure out you know, what went wrong. It, it says, I'm using an initialized value here, but that value came from, you know, was passed as a parameter up several layers of calls to this point before it got really looked at. 
So yeah, our strategy is to delay as long as possible because this reduces the noise level. Um, and it, essentially, we will complain about memcheck. Will complain whenever the use of an uninitialized value would possibly cause an exception. So either um, a, it would cause a bad, uh, cause a memory address to be undefined, you know, the address of a location, not the contents of that location. Or let's see, yes, when when you would um, effect like this when you would effectively write an undefined value into the program counter by jumping to uh, jumping on un uninitialized value or when you're passing garbage to a system, passing garbage to the kernel so it, it, these are really the only places where memcheck is going to complain and particularly in this kind of situation it can be a long time before um, the point at which it complains can be a long time after the garbage was created. That kind of kind of doesn't help. Uh, there's another another sort of minor question as well, which is: suppose I allocate an array you know, ten bytes long and then read off the end of it. Uh, what 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 does this what does this mean? So off the end of this array is kind of garbage. A of 10, well, it could be garbage, so maybe I should give an uninitialized value error. But the, the root cause of the problem here is that you're, you're using a bad address, not that you're using bad data. So there, there are situations when you're using the tool which it has to make a decision between bad, complain about bad address and complain about bad data, and it complains about um, bad addresses in this case. It's, it's sort of easier to understand. And then it doesn't complain about the fact that you're using bad data, even though you are. <clears throat> so um, we get a lot of questions on various Valgren mailing lists about how do I figure out what my program is really doing wrong um, when it complains. And this is about the best answer we can, we can give. If you look at the three categories again, if you, if you have an addressing error, well, it's, it tries to say you've got an invalid read or write of whatever size done at this point, and then it tries to say, it tries to describe the address in terms of the blocks that you've allocated and freed. Or, you know, it's some address on the stack, and it tries to say, you know, it's some address on the stack. Um, and that, that usually makes it fairly clear what the problem is. Um, for, for checking for leaks, well, that, that's sort of more difficult, and I, I don't have a good answer to that either. Um, you have to ask questions like who, you know, who, who was supposed to be owning this block, and um, where did, was the last point of the block overwritten? Can't very much. But the, the real problem is um, finding out where did my uninitialized value error come from. So in this example, we have some arrays which are presumably allocated with malloc, and then you're, you know, multiplying and checking. And it's going to say, you know, at this point it might say you're using an uninitialized value in this in this conditional. And your problem is, you don't know whether the uninitialized values come from the A array or the B array. So one thing you can do is sort of look through your program logic and you know, inspect where A and B have come from and try and figure out if either of those arrays contain garbage. Another thing you can do is to actually ask Valgren to tell you. Oh, didn't look that color before. Um, if you include this um, header file which comes with any installation of Valgren, then it, it has a bunch of magic macros and um, you can actually force it to check. You say, check that the whole A array is defined for 800 bytes, or, and also B is defined for 800 bytes. And then it'll tell you, you know, at, maybe it'll tell you at byte 504 along the A array, you have uninitialized garbage, or even the array is not even in addressable memory. Um, that's kind of, a, kind of a useful thing to do. That, that stops you having to look around. You can actually force it to make checks. So th these little macros, um, one thing about them is that when you run your program normally, not on Valgrind, then they have no effect. And 
they're very cheap as well. They take about four or five instructions. Uh, so that there's a sort of a, there's a, a magic trap door which your program can communicate with Valgrin to tell it stuff about memory management, to ask it questions about memory management. And that can be very useful. We use it a lot internally in the implementation, but it's also useful for, you know, power users, if you want to say that. So here's some other stuff which um, is kind of worth knowing, but not everybody that uses it seems to know it. One of the one of the problems that you get is that there are you know you get errors in libraries which you know like glibc or whatever proprietary library you manage to link into your application, um, and you can't you can't get rid of them you can't fix them so the about the only thing you can do is ask tell Valgrin not to not to show you these specific errors, um, so uh, you can create files of suppression files describing exactly errors that you don't want to see, and. So you say you dis, you specify a suppressions file like that, and you can ask that suppressions are generated using the gen suppressions flag. So it shows you an error. You say, "Give me a suppression so that I never see that error again." That's kind of useful. I know the KDE folks have a big suppressions file, which causes Valgrin to sort of stop complaining about some stuff that I don't know. I think a lot of people have them. Another thing which is um, sometimes useful to do is to describe your weird memory management scheme which is not, that you might be using in your program, which is not malloc and free. Um, and it, this goes back to using these, these uh, magic trapdoor macros again. So you can, I'm not exactly sure what all of these do now. Uh, uh, you can describe, I think you can describe that you have your own memory manager which is um, creating and destroying blocks, and these will participate in leak checking. Um, there are people who um, use some kind of pool-based memory managers, not really sure. Um, so you, there's a bunch of macros for creating memory pools. Um, these, these are low-level macros where you can just say, this area of memory is now off limits for whatever reason, and you know, tell me if I see any accesses in this area, or this area of memory is now um, addressable, but it contains garbage, or it's addressable contains data. For example, if you had a garbage collector, when an area of memory goes out of use for a while, you could um, paint it no access, and then you could put, paint it as writable when it comes back into circulation. Another thing you can do is um, a lot, lot of people want to do leak check in the middle of the program, not at the end, or they want to do leak checks multiple times along the execution of the program. So you can use this um, Valgrind do leak check macro, which will just run, you know, run a leak check at that point, and they typically will then do some kind of diff of the, the leak states from those various snapshot points. Um, if all else fails, there, there's, so there's lots of options, lots of command line options which subtly modify the way the thing works. It's worth playing around with those. They're useful. Um, you could file a bug report. Um, that's also very useful since we actually take notice of bug reports and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we even attempt to fix them. If you do file a bug report, don't just tell us that the system crashed, because that's completely useless. Make it possible for us to uh, reproduce your failure. I mean, that's an obvious thing to say, but you'd be amazed. Uh, and uh, mail us, because we even read our mail sometimes. Uh, seriously, um, if you want your giant, lardy application with bazillions of lines of code to run on Valgrind, and it doesn't for some reason, which can happen, uh, we're quite willing to work with people to figure out what's wrong, but you kind of need to work with us. And that, that's got stuff working many times in the past. So when should you use it? That's a good question. So if you use something like GDB, well, in my perhaps rather jaded view, GDB is only really useful for when, when the program has crashed you want to find out why it's crashed, well, I suppose you can set breakpoints and stuff as well. 
so you can use Valgrind or Memcheck when looking for a specific bug. But the thing that is the thing that's really valuable, and the point that the reason why I basically created in the first place is that to go looking for memory management bugs that you don't know that you have yet. So you've got a bug which may crash, cause it to crash on a user sometime in the future, uh, but you're kind of unlucky and you don't pick up the bug during testing. Well, you know, basically run the thing on Valgrin or Memcheck and keep fixing what it complains about until it doesn't complain anymore. And if you do that, then you'll have got rid of a certain class of memory management bugs from your application. And that, that tends to make the thing more stable before you release, which, you know, is good for everybody. Um, the best thing you can do is really to run your regression tests of your app, your suite, whatever, on Valgrind as well, so that, you know, you get the odds, odd corners of your application prodded and have the memory management being watched at the same time. Uh, people don't like to do that because it takes so long, but uh, it's sort of worth doing. Um, so, we, we quote this study too much, but one of the OpenOffice developers um, ran some basic tests from OpenOffice about, uh, you know, this is the OpenOffice 2 line about 18 months ago. And the, I think the, the thing that was really significant is this, that of the bugs that it picked up, he reckoned that a third of them would just crash OpenOffice if, if they ever actually appeared for a user. So, you know, you get rid of that, those bugs before the thing is ever released. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, people sometimes ask about whether the system produces too many, or produces false positives. You know, we, we get sometimes people saying, well, I don't believe this thing that it's complaining about, you know, particularly saying I'm using an uninitialized value here or I'm using a bad address. And, well, there's a lot of effort gone into making sure that Valkyrie very rarely tells you stuff which isn't true. So, m almost all of the time, you know, 99% of the time, if it complains about something, it's right. Um, if you attempt to run highly optimized code on it, you can sometimes fool it. So, I suggest, I suggest you don't go above minus O with, with GCC. But minus O and memcheck is okay. So just before I finish, the other tools are also extremely useful. I've kind of mentioned them. Cache is a great, great little cache profiler which can tell you information which seems to be very hard to find by other means. Um, so you go, go, basically you can find, find out where you're screwing up in your caches. Um, or, you know, your, all the three instruction D1 and level two cache. <coughs> And um, these, these sort of cause your performance to mysteriously drain away for no apparent reason, for often very unobvious reasons. So it will profile at the level of you know, the whole program, functions, lines of code, or even individual instructions. It'll tell you this individual instruct, this specific instruction is causing 80% of the cache misses in your program. And it'll print annotated source code and whatever. Um, nowadays, we can actually run Valgrind on Valgrind itself, which um, means that we can profile Valgrind running stuff, and that's turned out to be very useful. We found a, got rid of a whole bunch of cache misses, which uh, means it'll be a little bit faster. Uh, the space profiler, well, I, I mentioned that. It's kind of useful, useful for finding out who allocated what and how the allocation it doesn't just tell you at the end, it, it'll track along the way and then show you pictures of, as your program is running of the, the, the space use and who allocated what and who's holding on to what and why. And this is kind of useful, I think, for um, dealing with space problems. Uh, I haven't actually used it myself. One of the frustrations of being a Valgrind developer is we don't actually really get to use it, so we don't have that clear a picture of how um, users use it. Um, Colgrind and, its, and the GUI KCashGrind is an is a external tool from Joseph Wiedendorfer, and uh, you may well have used it. I think it's got, got used quite a lot, at least by KDE folks, for profiling stuff, and I think also by a lot of other folks. 
um, has a has a nice complicated GUI which will show you all sorts of stuff about cost attribution between callers and callees. Um, Helgrin is the is the tool that we had for finding threading errors. Um, it, it really looks for memory locations for which it cannot show that there is adequate locking when this location is accessed by more than one thread, um, which is the kind of summary of a, a data race, really. So Helgren stopped working about a year ago due to some other threading-related changes. We're now back in a state where we have the infrastructure to make it work, and now what we need is a, a person to actually push this along. So uh, we're looking for we're looking for somebody to put it back together, make it work. It's a difficult problem, but because you need to know lots of stuff about threading and assembly programming and stuff, but we are looking for volunteers to fix it. So if you can do that, or you know somebody can, point them our way. Um, what's coming up? We have we are currently on Valgrin 310. We'll do a, do a bug fix release next week. It's kind of overdue. Um, doing a new major release in about seven weeks. So um, there's various things, but the most significant thing is that we um, have a, a we're reducing the performance overheads of the the memcheck tool in a in a space way mostly. Also, it's slightly faster. Uh, we're integrating Colgrin because um, it's it's a very popular tool and it's easier for us to. Um, do quality releases if it's integrated. Uh, and we're generally improving um, performance and stability. We're always looking to improve stability and make stuff run which doesn't run. For example, it, it may well be that we um, are able to support Wine in version 3.2, which means that you should be able to run you know, whatever Wine can run, whatever Windows application you can run. On top of it, that would be fun. <laughs> it's actually been done before. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Well, okay. Uh, if you like writing large parallel programs using MPI, then uh, we will have some support for you. If you want to run on PowerPC 64, we can do that now as well. Um, there's, we will have um, another release of the, the GUI for Memcheck. Uh, which will be nice. And this, if what I'm saying here is, if you have a big application which you would like to memcheck eyes or generally Valgrind eyes, and it doesn't work, then don't just do nothing. Mail us and um, see if we can fix whatever needs to be fixed in order to make it work. Um, if you don't do that, then you're just going to wind up with a 3.2 release, which still won't run your thing. So basically, if it doesn't work, complain. And further along, yes, we would like to make, make Helgrind work again. That would be a good thing. We get quite a lot of people asking about this thread checking tool. So this is our uh, cool picture, which is great. Um, yes, the only th if you only remember one thing, use it and get rid of memory management bugs, because it's good, good for your end users, and it's good for your own sanity. <laughs> Yeah, should use it.